Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 96, which reads as follows. Santang tasa manang hoti, santa vaja chakamacha, samadanya vimutasa, upasantasa tadino, which means calm or peaceful is his or is that person's mind peaceful their speech and their acts who with right knowledge is freed such a one who is such a one for such a one no such a one who is at peace themselves So one who has right, right who is delivered through right knowledge, who is at peace themselves, something like that. So talking about the three doors, the three doors of of karma, the mind door, the were a speech door and the body door. These are the three ways we can perform karma. And such a such a one who has become free is peaceful in all of these. This story is one of the more heartwarming stories. Not a long story. It's a story about a certain monk who seems to have practiced well, um, learned all of the rules of the monkhood. He was known as Kosambi Vasi Tissa. His name was Tissa. Tissa was like a common name like John back then. It's a very common name, but Kosambi Vasi means he dwelled at Kosambi. And uh, he, he stayed there for the three rains, for the three months of the rains retreat. And at the end, uh, the layperson who looked at, who was looking after him, came to him and, and offered him uh, a set of robes and some medicines. So the kind of medicines like sugar or uh, honey or uh, uh, ghee, like butter, you know kind of medicines that actually you can only keep for a certain amount of time. And so the monk didn't immediately receive them because uh, monks can only have one set of robes and they can only keep these medicines for a short time and can only use them when they're sick and that kind of thing. So he says something that's actually quite interesting from a monastic point of view. He says, he asks, what are they? And the lay disciple says, oh, these are the offering that we give to the monk whenever they, whoever stays with us. Please accept them. And he says, I'm sorry, I have no need of, need of these because he can't reasonably take them and use them. And he says, why, why can't you take them? And he says, what he says is interesting. He says that he has no novice to, um, to perform the usual duties. And I think the meaning here is that the novice would take the robes and offer them to the elder if, there, if the need should, ar should arise. So they were using the novices. It's kind of odd to sort of get around the rules by having a novice carry these things for you. And I'm not convinced that it's the best reading of the rules, but uh, these stories tend to ha have those sorts of uh, practices in them that don't seem exactly to be how it was laid out in the, by the Buddha, but Anyway, who am I to know? But that's that's sort of how it went, whether right or wrong, I don't know. And so the the layman says, "Oh well, if that's true, uh, take my son. Take my son with you and have him ordained as a novice, and he'll look after you, and I guess carry your sugar and your butter around for you. Because novices don't have those kind of rules that they can't keep this, they can't keep that." And so he accepted, and 
this, his son, who was seven years old, he gives him over to the elder and uh, says, please accept him as a novice. So the other ta elder takes the boy, wa wets his hair, uh, teaches him the Dajja Panchaka Kamatana, the, the five-fold meditation with the skin as its fifths, meaning Gesa, hair on the head, Loma, hair on the body, Nakha, nails, Danta, teeth, Dajjo is the skin. Kesa, Loma, Naka, Tanta, Dajjo. These are what you teach a, a, a new monk. It's the tradition because it's a basic meditation. It's focusing on the parts of the body to help see them as they are and not be uh, partial towards them or, or against them. Useful for monks if they find themselves getting into thoughts of lust about the body, lust for the body. And uh, as soon as the razor, it says, as soon as the razor touched his head, the novice became an arahant. The boy became an arahant. He was ready. He was he was clearly someone who had been uh, cultivating perfections and been cultivating good things for a long time because that was all it took. Just this this click with the uh, teaching of this meditation and the changing the the, the recognition. Probably he was a monk in his past life. And uh, so he, he became an arahant right away and didn't tell the elder. The elder had no idea. Because the elder actually, being a good monk, well, he was. But he wasn't uh, enlightened. He was just an ordinary worldling. Uh, and so he stayed there for another two weeks. And then he decided to go back to see the Buddha. He thought, well, I'll bring this novice to go and see the Buddha. That'll be good way to introduce him to the the Buddha's sasana and maybe the Buddha can teach him something maybe it'll help him on his own path because who knows, maybe one day this novice will become a good meditator like me something like that and so on the way they stopped off at this lodging and at a, at a monastery but they only had one kuti and Because the novice spent all his time looking after the elder. He, he got a kuti for the elder and he spent his time doing all these duties that uh, the novice would have to do, is sweeping it out and you know, uh, opening windows, closing windows, uh, putting on, putting the bed down and so on. And by the time he had taken care of the elder's needs, it was too late for him to get a kuti for himself, a hut for himself. And so the elder said, you know, you don't have a... He said, oh, don't you have a kuti for yourself? No, I'm sorry, I don't. No opportunity. So the elder said, well, then fine, you just stay with me. You can just stay with me and uh, in the morning we'll, we'll, we'll look after it. It would be better, better to stay with me than, than elsewhere. And, so, and then the elder goes and lies down on the bed and immediately falls asleep because he's just an ordinary worldling. But the novice, thinking, the novice realizes something, and that is that this is, for the past two nights, he has also spent a night with... Novices have a rule. He's not a tr full monk. A novice takes on ten precepts, so they're allowed to wear the robes, but they haven't yet become a monk. So they haven't... They, they are not uh, considered to be... Uh, in the inner circle, I guess you could say. But the point is, they still don't fit in with the monks. And so to be in too close uh, association can lead to problems and, and uh, difficulties for the monks. So they are only, so only allowed to stay with the monks for a maximum of two nights. After the third night, it's not that they're not allowed to, it's that the monk commits an offense if he stays with a non-ordained person three nights in a row. Meaning, so, because the idea is monks have to stick to themselves, have to not get too in too close association with people who are not keeping the rules because it can drag them down and so on. And it can, people who haven't yet been trained as monks can often, you know, criticize unjustly, you know. Well, the story went that the monks were snoring or something and the monks, and the lay people 
started getting critical of, of them and overly critical or that kind of thing. You know, they lose any sense of respect. Uh, so, anyway, there's some sense that they have to be a bit separate. And the novice realized this, and he realized if I stay in here overnight, as he told me, um, he'll be breaking a rule. Can't have that. So the novice sits up, sits cross-legged and s comfortably, because he's an arahant, just does practices sitting meditation all night. Because the loophole to the rule, again, it's all about loopholes, it seems, uh, is that if he's sitting up, it's not considered to have slept, have, have stayed together overnight. Don't ask me, but that somehow helps, that fixes things. And he stayed there all night, and, and the elder just snored away, totally oblivious. But the elder did wake up in the morning and was actually conscientious, conscientious enough to think about this. And he woke up in a completely pitch dark, still the night, still still not a full night. And so he he picks up his, he's on the bed, and he reaches over and he picks up his fan, so in those times the monks would have a fan to blow, drive away mosquitoes and to cool themselves off in the heat and that kind of thing. Different uses for a fan. And he he, he took the fan and he pounded the mat where he knew the, the novice was. And he said, hey, wake up. You have to go outside. And then uh, the novice didn't say anything, so he threw the, he threw the fan at the novice. Uh, he didn't see him, he didn't know where the novice was He thought the novice was lying down So he said, okay, I'll, I'll you know, maybe aim towards his feet or something And the novice, because he was sitting up The fan hit him square in the eye And poked his eye out Destroyed his eye And the elder had no idea, the elder had no clue the novice, knowing that his eye was poked out, what does he do? He says to the elder, what did you say? Because I guess he was a little distracted. He says, get out, get out, it's time to go out. So the novice, what does he do? Covers his eye, whichever eye it was, covers his eye with one hand, and gets up and walks out. Doesn't say anything about it, <laughs> completely quiet. And on top of that, not only does he is he totally neutral, totally composed, having just had his eye poked out, he goes and does the duties of a of a visiting monk. So he goes and sweeps the tray, sweeps the paths, sweeps out the the outhouse, sets out water for the elder washing. He sweeps, you know, he's got one hand, and so he's sweeping with one hand with the broom sweeping out the, the outhouse and putting out water for washing and water for drinking. And then he even goes and gets a tooth, a tooth, uh, you know, they, they had these sticks that they would use to brush their teeth. You can still get them in India, it's kind of neat. On the Buddhist circuit, you can, I got a whole bunch of them when I was there last year. And so he brought, he brings a tooth, a toothbrush to the elder monk and it's kind of dark, so the elder doesn't really see, but he sees the novice come with one hand and offer him a, a toothbrush. And apparently another one of the um, customs when offering to an elder in order to uh, cultivate respect is to offer it with two hands. So this is protocol between monks, and junior monks, senior monks, novices and senior monks. For lay people, they can do as they like, but there's a kind of a protocol to, in order to keep humility and not get arrogant and not. You know. So we go. If someone's senior, then you offer to them with with two hands. And so the elder got kind of uh, miffed at this. He said, well, what, "What kind of a novice are you? Not properly trained, offering toothbrush to your teacher with one hand. What kind of novice does that? He's kind of. I thought I, thought I taught you better than that." The novice says, Venerable Sir, I know full well how to the, the, the rules that are to be performed, but uh, my one hand isn't free. My one hand isn't uh, disengaged. What? What's wrong? What's, wh wh why, why can't you use your other hand? 
And then the novice has to tell them. So the novice relates to him from start to finish. I was sitting up. Because I was sitting up when you threw the fan at me, you poked my eye out. And uh, the elder is understandably uh, upset, moved, shaken by this, and he bows down. He, he, he goes down on his knees and says, the novice, please forgive me. I am so sorry. Would, uh, please spare me, kind of thing. Be my refuge, is what the Pali says. And he crouches down on the ground in front of him and begs him for forgiveness. And the novice, what does he do? Just com perfection after perfection. This is a, a, a wonderful way of describing the Arahant. Because remember, the seven-year-old kid is, an, is a fully enlightened being, or an enlightened being, not a Buddha, but an Arahant. He says, Venerable Sir, it isn't your fault. So it was not it was not it was not because it was not in order to shame you that I spoke. I just wanted to let you know what happened. I knew you know, I had to ease your mind. But I didn't tell you also to, to ease your mind. I I didn't it's not that I wanted to keep it from you. It's that I knew you might get upset and so in order to spare you that I didn't say anything. It's not your fault. You're not to blame. This is the fault of samsara, he says. This is the fault of the rounds of rebirth. You know, if you're going to be reborn, these things are going to happen. And he leaves it at that. This seven-year-old kid, can you imagine? And so the elder is even, even further moved by that. And the novice tries to comfort him, but he won't be, covered, co he won't be comforted. So he takes the novice to the Buddha. He picks up the novice's bowl and requisites and carries them for the novice and brings him to the Buddha shaking his head and, and weeping the whole way and when they get to the Buddha they, he goes straight straight to the Buddha and, and bows down and prepares to tell the Buddha and the Buddha says oh Bhikkhu is everything okay with you? <laughs> what kind of, how do you answer that? Right? He says I trust you have not suffered any excess discomfort and the monk says, Bhante, I, I indeed have lived at quite at quite an ease myself, but here I have this novice with me. Uh, take a look at this this novice. He's, he, he is beyond anything that I've ever seen. And the Buddha said, what, why, what has he done? And the elder told the whole story to the Buddha. And he said, I don't understand, when, when when I asked him to pardon, when I asked him to forgive me, he said, it's not your fault, it's the fault of samsara. Don't be disturbed, don't be upset. He tried to comfort me you know, when here he is with his eye poked out, holding it with one hand, offering me a toothbrush. And the Buddha says, oh, those who have freed themselves from defilements, have neither anger nor hatred towards anyone. On the contrary, they are in a state of calm, their senses, their mind, their speech, and their body. And then he taught this verse. His thoughts are calm, his speech is calm. Santang dasa manang hoti. The mind of such a person is calm, Speech is calm. His deeds are calm. Who has? Who? What sort of person is this one who has freed themselves with right knowledge? Upasantasa tadino. Someone who is tranquil or peaceful. So, what can we learn from this? Uh, it, you know, it 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 sets the sets the bar right. It it holds no, doesn't hold any punches. This is telling us how far we plan, we intend to go, how far we can go, how how um, perfect we expect to become through through the practice, how far we believe it possible to go. Maybe not in this life, but eventually through the practice, our understanding. Is this isn't some simple thing where oh yes, you've you, you know you don't complain 
uh, about a toothache anymore. Uh, or when you get a, have a stomach ache, you're okay. Or you're okay skipping lunch now because you've let go. Uh, it's not like that. Where we're going is to the, to the end of suffering, where one really doesn't react, really doesn't get upset, where one is really and truly able to experience things as they are. The, so the mind and the speech and the body don't become tranquil because you don't encounter bad things. It's not about building up such good karma that you never experience bad things. It's not that kind of invincible. It's the invincibility of the mind where you have seen clearly. And the wonderful thing is that it just it comes simply from seeing clearly, which is the, the, the point of this verse. That true true peace, the kind that can see you through losing an eye or a limb or even your life. That kind of peace and tranquility is only to be found through wisdom and is to be found simply through wisdom. With, with no other requirement whatsoever. Because when you see things as they are, there's no reason to get upset. There's no benefit to getting upset. There's no benefit to be had for, from this novice yelling and screaming and wailing and crying. It's reasonable. If it would be reasonable if he did, you'd think, well, he's only human. But somehow this is the idea, is that an enlightened being becomes goes beyond the ordinary state of a human. We're able to attain a state of greatness, a state of, a state of profound peace and tranquility. So this is again something for us to emulate, but I think more here is something for us to compare. How would you fare if you lost an eye in that way? Hmm? Sometimes it's good to think about these things. It's good to imagine the situation. It gives you a chance to see your own defilements, to get a taste of what you have left to accomplish, what is left inside of you that will cause you suffering. Because losing an eye doesn't cause you suffering. It's only when you react negatively to it. Oh, that's not what I wanted. When you had expectations for that eye, right? Wanted to use it for things. But this novice had no use for the eye. Losing it was like uh, losing a piece of trash, meaningless, of no consequence. Because his peace was, uh, his happiness was independent of the eye, independent of the physical body, independent of anything in the world. That's where our practice leads us. It's not like we want to lose an eye, or it's you know. I mean, how could you come, how could you criticize this? Wouldn't it, you know, wouldn't it be great if, when the most hor horrific thing happened to us, we could be happy? Because horrific things do happen to people, and they're horrified by them. They're, uh, they can go crazy because of them. Wouldn't it be great if that weren't the case? Wouldn't it be great if we could deal with anything that we wouldn't have to live our lives in fear, protecting our bodies constantly, obsessing over them, worried about them? Worried about wrinkles, worried about fat, worried about this and that. Well, here we see how far we are and how far we have to go. And we can see the need for work, that we have work to do, because we really have a long way to go. It's not enough to say, oh, look at me, I, I, don't, I had back pain and now I can deal with the back pain. Can you deal with losing an eye? And you know how far away you are from the goal. So, anyway, that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, keep practicing. And wishing you...